Toby. Welcome to my place. I love Doctor Who and ice cream. Now, I can't share my ice cream with you, but I've got a whole host of Doctor Who. And I've got a friend to choose a story for us to watch. They've also identified their favourite things about this story. So as we watch along, and I'll chat to you, we're going to see if we can identify what it is we think that my friend thinks is so special about this particular adventure. So let's go and set up. But first, let's meet our special guest. Hi there, uh, Johnny Candon here, writer, astronaut and liar. Um, so, um, let me think. The uh, turn left. Yes, um, that's a fantastic story. Thank you, Toby. Um, there's many things to love about it. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we're going to watch the first New Who, for want of a better description, episode we're doing for this podcast, if you're listening, videocast if you're watching. And if you don't know that there's the alternative, there is. Uh, and however you're watching it, in whatever medium, press play on turn left in three, two, one. Okay, so, sorry, there was no volume on that for some reason. Um, so we're on the planet, whatever it's called. Uh, this is, of course, this is a Dr. Light episode. In those days that, um, this is really good, isn't it? Seems it's not on screen for long. Uh, a Dr. Light episode. Um, uh, at a time when, of course, they were making so many episodes or whatever, the production schedule was such that we, we had an episode where the Doctor hardly ever appeared, which is unthinkable! Um, and, and, and unless you count the first season when the Doctor isn't even in two episodes of The Keys of Marinus. Uh, various Hartnell has various episodes off. He even has his penultimate ever episode off. Um, well, it's penultimate in... Please don't go, I think you'll find it's pronounced whatever episode was, uh, episode three of the three doctors. Yes, all right. Um, this is all unrehearsed and off the top of my head, so allow me the odd turn of phrase that uh, you could generously interpret uh, to, to assume that I know, you know what I mean and I know what I mean. Anyway, it's, anno it's very annoying that you have to put those disclaimers in, but it is part of saying anything about Doctor Who out loud. I shall try not to keep... Uh, th think about that every time I do one of these, but you do have an eye on the I think you'll find us. Uh, it's really annoying. <laughs> uh, this is great. This is this is really atmospheric. Um, and, you know, a fortune teller is, is a kind of, well, we've had them before, haven't we? She's, it's not quite snake dance, but, you know, it's quite a it's quite a trope. But it's just it's done very nicely and it's, do, it's done with great economy. Um, and this is Chipo Chong, who... Uh, uh, was Chantho in uh, Utopia, and obviously they liked her and went, well, she was covered in makeup, let's get her back. Uh, actors like that, it's a bit of loyalty. Uh, oh, and of course, yes, because we're gonna, because this, it's like a clip show, except it's not, because all the clips are, are different, but that's very clear. But it's, it's like you're watching several different stories. Or, 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 you know, yeah, no, like a clip show. It's like one of those episodes of an American thing where you, they remember stuff, except the genius is this is nothing like as cheap as that because they've had to, they, they've had to redo it all and get people back, as we will see. Um, I haven't watched this story a lot. I always think of this story as a kind of, for one, as a Dr. Light. That's not a reason not to watch one. I mean, Blink uh, is amazing. But, but also I think of it as a sort of setup, isn't it? It's a segue between the rest of the season and the season finale, Bells and Whistles, which was such big news at the time. My God, it was so exciting to be a Doctor Who fan at this time. Oh, I mean, thinking about it, I haven't, you know, I, I don't get to revisit these apart from, you know, to watch, well, what, yes, because one of the reasons that I'm, I'm sort of doing this and have the new series in my mind is we're in, I'm in lockdown. I'm in lockdown uh, and for the first 
three or four months of lockdown, uh, apart from myself and my partner, we had uh, a friend of ours, Mo, who is like my partner, disabled and, and uh, would have been on her own and, and, and without the assistance that she requires. So we had her here uh, and she'd never seen Doctor Who and Emily Cook did these Doctor Who tweet-alongs. So we watched Rose uh, and I turned to Mo, who'd never seen Doctor Who before. And, uh, and I said, what did you make of that? And she went, well, it was different. And I said, different to what? And she went, everything else. And I thought, That's, isn't that a great description of Doctor Who? It's different from everything else. And she really liked it. So then we watched loads of Russell T. Davis episodes. Um, but actually, we didn't watch this one because I thought this was quite sort of continuity heavy. So we, we, we skipped this. Um, we sort of went back and forth anyway. Um, uh, so I haven't, I haven't seen this. There's something on your back. That's great. And, and also, that's been the thing throughout this, the season, hasn't it? There's something on your back. He's very good, Russell T. Davis, at very economical things that get you really excited. What is that? There's something on your back. It's so evocative, isn't it? There's something on your back. Uh, and, and also, it, uh, not unlike the spider on the back of Sarah in uh, Planet of the Spiders, and as Doctor Who fans, we always like something that reminds us of something that's happened before. We're, we're so excited about new things that we really like it, but they remind us of old things. And of course, it's a great premise, isn't it? It's the sliding doors premise. It's that if I do a different thing. And uh, interesting, I'm making all these comparisons. That's not to suggest it's derivative, but it, but it, it, it takes sort of storytelling techniques that we know and are comfortable with. And yet it's, it's wholly brilliant. Um, oh, Billy, Billy Piper actually gets a credit at the beginning. I'd forgotten that. Okay. Um, and of course, this was big news that Rose was back. I have to say, I'm not sure how I felt about that. I, th I think, because I love Rose, and I love Rose's ending. Um, and, I, and I worried, I always felt a bit with the X-Files when, you know, they'd get rid of a character brilliantly, but they liked the actor. Which again, I, I'm always appreciative of. Um, that's that's Natalie Walter, who was at a wedding I was at last year. I was at a wedding at Peckforton Castle, which is where they filmed the Time Warrior. It was a, it's a very Doctor Who wedding. I was I sat next to Norna from Frontios, Leslie Dunlop, uh, for the whole of the dinner. Uh, and my, my, my friend didn't put me there because she was Norna. I don't know why, but I have met her before with that friend. But anyway, he put us together. But, but Natalie Walter was there because she is, this is going to say, I'm not a show, I'm not a, I, I will name drop an extra from a 1964 Doctor Who story. That will make me feel like I've done something exciting. But I'm, I'm going to sound awful now. Uh, Natalie Walter is a best friend of Denise Van Outen. So Denise Van Outen was at this wedding because she was a friend of the bride. Uh, uh, and Natalie Walter was her friend plus one or whatever. I didn't, I didn't get to meet Natalie Walter at the wedding, but I had met her before because she was in the audience when I saw David Tennant's Hamlet. And also in the audience was a friend of mine, by coincidence, from a play that I'd been in. And I saw her, Madeline. Oh, no, I'm Madeline. And she said, oh, I'm going to the pub to meet some of the cast. So I was like, brilliant. So I went with her and we met some of the cast, uh, including the voice of the Gelf, Zoe Thorne. And I think Natalie Walter is, if not a friend of hers, she was a friend of somebody else in the, in the cast. So I met Natalie Walter and the voice of the Gelf. And the guy, Edward Bennett, who's a very good actor, who played Laertes, he went, you, why are you really excited to meet these two women? What? I said, because they both been in Doctor Who. <laughs> and he picked it up. And we, I didn't know, we'd just been chatting that night. He was a, he was a friend of my friend. Um, he said, you are a big fan, aren't you? What were they in it? I stopped. Not much. But <laughs> um, so, so Natalie Walter, I, she is, I think, is stalking me uh, because I've met her twice. Uh, but I love that moment where she's she's got the scared thing going on. I always felt sorry because he's, that's, that's the shot from The Christmas Invasion. And that man in the tax says fire. But he doesn't he doesn't get a, a credit. You know, it's a speaking part. So I wonder if he was... The fire is in ADR, but um, in the older days, I think you'd have got a credit for that.
Um, this, uh, and of course, this is Clive Standen, who is in the Sontar and Stratham. So I, he could say he's a regular, really, because he's obviously playing the same part. Obviously, his character was killed in Sontar and Stratham, wasn't he? But I suppose he could say, ah, but this predates that, because it's in this universe, this is before that. So in fact, the Doctor dying now probably saves his life. <laughs> um, so that's that's quite nice continuity that they get they get a soldier back from the Sontaran strategy. And he was in he was in the US series of Taken, which I, I only watched the first episode of. I wasn't terribly taken with it, but that's good for a, a UK actor to have a lead in that. And I think he's in Vikings as well. Uh, so he's done very well for himself. The casting, they, they tend to get people like him and David Adjala and all sorts of people who then go on to have good careers in the States. There's some very prescient casting goes on in Doc 2 these days, not just of get, you know, getting people of high, high profile, but I think having an eye on who's, you know, who's got a good future. Billy Piper is back now, I was saying, wasn't I, before I did my actor spotty thing, I was slightly uneasy about Rose coming back just because her ending had been so good. And I, and I think it's lovely that people like working with people, but, and, and I can absolutely see the temptation. Um, and I've never been involved in, in a long running series, so it's, it's never been um, something I've ever had to do. And, and you know, I, I, I run a I regularly compare a comedy club, and, and if you like working with somebody and they do well, you can invite them back a year later in the audience. It, it's not, there's no diminishing returns there because when they finish, they don't they don't die or get trapped in an alternate universe. They just go, I've finished my gig and I'm going over. But but I find um, but I I just I don't know. I was I was concerned about bringing Rose back just because her ending had been so good. That's oh my god, I've forgotten Basker Patel's in. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. This is going to sound like the worst. Basker Patel was also at the wedding at Peckerton Castle of my friend. I've met him loads of times at, um, at, at sort of do's because he works with a friend. And I, I remember Russell T. Davis being very, very keen on Cliff, who's an extra. Um, but Bas Basker is very funny. He's quite sweary and naughty <laughs> and, and he's good fun. Uh, I like him. Uh, I've forgotten he was in this. Uh, <laughs> um... <laughs> she's an extra as well that's great because with actually only two speaking parts and I love all this um, Russell's very good at getting the news you know the news to to um, uh, emphasise the import of, of something you know and it's it's very War of the Worlds it's very, very Nigel Neal um, Nigel Neal was always you know having news reporters so that the, the scale of it and the fact that it was sort of invading people's homes via the media is is a great device and Russell T Davis uses it from you know from as early as Alien Runners but I, I love this you've got Anne-Marie Beatrice and Cliff. all all of these characters are supporting artists they're not they're not um, you know they're not characters with lines and yet you totally believe that office environment um we talk about, I often, and I'm sure I will talk, oh, and Morgan Stern's back, uh, and which is nice because he's really good in uh, Ben Wrighton in uh, uh, Smith & Jones, Smith & Jones. Uh, and this is, this is, so it's nice that he gets a chance. His, his mum stood as a Conservative MP uh, just after this, I think. Uh, I don't think I've got any more details right now, but she did. Um, oh, I, I love Bernard Cribbins. It's, it's a very sad circumstances, obviously, that he he came to be in this because all of this was, I guess, originally earmarked for Howard Atfield, who who uh, played Rose's dad, who was going to be, you know, the regular family member throughout the series. But he was he was poorly and he died, and they had to refilm his stuff for Partners in Crime and. Somebody had the genius. I think it was, was it Phil Collinson or was it Phil Collinson? I think it was Phil Collinson. Uh, said, oh, well, why not get 
why not get Bernard Crimmins in? Um, oh, but Sarah Jane Smith. Haha. <laughs> so they just killed Sarah Jane Smith. Which, and this is horrible, because it's, it's always, because of the way that it's told as well, not only are we getting the sort of clip show of what could have, well, the whole premise um, of, of what happens if the doctor isn't there, what happens if the doctor dies, ripple effect, but also this great thing of going, and so I can kill ever, because we always like the, we all like the end of Inferno, don't we, when they go, oh, because it's an alternative universe uh, that, you know, we can actually kill everybody, we can destroy the world. Which is which is what what um, uh, what happens there and here you go well everybody that we can't normally kill because they've got their own series we can kill but also I guess it's a budgetary thing but actually a storytelling thing as well we we don't have them we don't see it we don't get those actors in they sort of die off screen <laughs> that's that's really harsh and it's really compelling. And you sort of revel in it. It's like, it's, it's sort of like grief porn. Uh, it's, it's a really satisfying experience because you know that the story has got to be that the, the clock resets. But then it allows, so you literally, you do, you have your cake and you eat it. And, and then the cake gets made again. Um, and when I say I'm not sure about Rose coming back. I'm I'm sort of glad she did now because as uh, as much Rose everything and I and I always felt a bit sorry for for Martha because he was always going on about Rose. So it, it, she needed to come back because he wouldn't shut up about her. Uh, and obviously an important part of the the story to bookend David Tennant's Doctor. Um, but I know I I don't think I was as Although when I saw her in Partners in Crime, I was very, very excited. So I think we've always got one eye on what's going to disappoint us about something, even if it's exciting as Doc Two fans. I'm just flagging it up because I, I remember there was a there was a caveat. If I was going to say I wasn't, I was I was trying to move to me not being excited, but that's not true because I was. I like her blue leather jacket. Don't know much about clothes, but I like a blue leather jacket. This, all that, 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 her being out of focus when she disappears stuff is very good. This is Graham Harper, isn't it, directing this? Such a good director. Um, I'd say not his normal fare, but then again, nor's the unicorn of the wasp. I love Bernard Cribbins. I want, I, I want a Bernard Cribbins of my own. <laughs> and uh, Jacqueline King's very good as well because it's a. It's, she's obviously not a very sympathetic character but she's not one-dimensional at all um i took you totally believe her and in fact that's lovely because i think of sylvia as being you know a bit of a pain and actually she's got so many human moments uh, i mean yeah sorry um i'm 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 an unashamed fan of uh russell t davis and this era of doctor who there was nothing more exciting than being a Doctor Who fan at this time. Uh, where was I when I watched this? Can't remember. Because um, I was working quite a lot at this time. I was I was touring my one man show. It was a personally a very satisfying time for me as well. Uh, I've had my ups and downs, but now this is Laura. Is it Laura Velez who is? The sister of Lauren Velez, who is, who's the captain in Dexter, and uh, and is also in Oz, some some quite hardcore American series. Um, so what's the captain called? It, captain da 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 da. Oh. but anyway, she's a regular character all the way through, pretty much. Um, and she's her sister, so I don't know what she was doing in the UK. <laughs> um, uh, and isn't it just clever that she's a, a Spanish maid? So. She's saying it in a different language, which means that Donna doesn't quite understand what she's saying, but it also gives it a kind of a heightened, a heightened feel. Oh, Jason Mohammed is a news reporter. Well, we know he's a news reporter because he's quite famous now. In fact, I saw him on the list of, he's in the top 10, or he was at some point, of the BBC's highest paid presenters. But I'm sure Russell said 
on one of the commentaries, it's years since I've watched a commentary on one of these, that, that he was a bit of a fan of Doctor Who, so he was happy to do it. But now he's, yeah, now he's, I, certainly at one point he was in the, because I think he does the football now, doesn't he? I don't know much about football. Um, but yeah, he was in the top 10 highest earners at BBC. Well done. Um, I'm, I also present on the BBC. I don't think I'm in the top 10 million earners. Um, but this is great. We've just blown up London. That's cracking. I, I, I meant to, I meant to get a note. I can't move because I'm being filmed as I do this. Um, I meant to get a notepad because when I get to the end of the few I've done of these, I keep forgetting to write down what the things I like are. Oh, I've got a computer here. I might do that. What are the things I like? Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, so, yeah, turn left. I do like, I know I like, I like, <laughs> I like the point. Of, it's a bit silly. Um, it's, it, it's a bit arch, the sort of pointy, I've got your number, girl. You've got a bad spider on your back and you're probably something to do with this nuclear explosion. And I know that because I'm Spanish and we can pick things up because we're exotic and foreign. <laughs> I mean, it's got all that encapsulated in that sort of, oh, you're a wrong and point. But I do kind of like it. Um, they're going to Leeds. And this, I love this sort of bleak. He likes a sort of um, life in wartime thing, Russell T. Davis, doesn't he? Because there's a bit of that in... Uh, uh, Last of the Time Lords um, and there was even a bit in sort of years and years with the refugee camps and stuff and, and I liked all that stuff when it was in V you know where there was an underground resistance and that kind of you know living sparsely this reminds me a bit of Noah's Castle which was a, an ITV thing I didn't watch much I don't think I watched it particularly at the time I, I, I caught bits of it and, and it seemed very grown up and it was basically a a drama about recession and stockpiling with with a bit of Jack May being a... It's, it's, the star is the president from the Caves of Androzani and um, uh, Seth from the Horns of Nymon. And I'm sure there's, there's a bit where General Hermat comes to live with them and, and there's an inference that he might, for a bit of cash, covet the president's daughter. And, and, they, and it's a kind of... Yeah, well, he's terribly important. So, you know, that's 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 my recollection anyway. Uh, I do have it on DVD somewhere. Um, I, I, now, I remember a few people being a bit, oh, the Italian. Like, well, he's, I mean, he is Italian. Joseph Long is Italian. Um, speaks Italian. And, and he needs to be a big character uh, because... Well, because of the whole dynamics that we're going to see and the changes. And, and, and actually, it works really well that they go into the house of a big person. As you see Jacqueline King just retreat into herself. And she's, I've forgotten about this. She is quite brilliant. Um, uh, and it would be too depressing. And there are people, you know, there are people who are positive And because of what we see later, the deflation is... is is, is again very important. You don't want everybody to be grim at this point. We know the situation is grim. We can see it, it's in the visuals, it's in the story. So he's actually not what you expect. Uh, I, I love Rocco and I know for a fact um, what one of my favorite things is gonna be. And I suspect Johnny Candon will have chosen it too, but I can't not choose it. I can't not choose what it is. Uh, look at Jacqueline King, you know, having been a valiant and eating chocolates and Sylvia's a force of nature, isn't she? She just, she just sort of recesses into herself. I met Jacqueline King at a wedding as well. God, I've forgotten about that. It, well, that was a slightly sad, it was a wedding of a, a mutual friend of ours who was getting married because he'd, he'd been given a short, short time to live. But she was absolutely lovely. Uh, she was really, because I was because I didn't know anybody there really. Until I met a few people later on, and uh, she came and sat at my table, and we had a right old chat. And I said, "I'm oh, just on oh, the Doctor Who guy," and she was lovely. Uh, I don't mean to name drop. Sorry, it's. I just think it might be quite interesting if you think I've met a person, but I don't. You know, I don't wander around going. Uh, I, do you know I've met uh, all of the human cast from Mission to the Unknown? I mean, I have. 
but um, I, I don't want that to be on my list of achievements when I die. I do have ambition that involves not meeting other people. You know, that might be something I've done. But um, I don't know if you're tuning into this. I would hope you're interested in that sort of stuff. But um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of name dropping and have enough self-loathing to at least flag it up so that you know that I know. Yeah. Oh, dear. Um, so what uh, this is really good, isn't it? Um, and it's. It's amazing what Doctor Who can do and the different sort of stories it can tell, because it's about to, and of course, this is a, a compromise story because they are the doctor's not in it. I mean, the, lest we forget, the Doctor is not in it. Catherine Tate is so good. Um, and I was... And Donna's not very nice. I'd hate Donna in real life. And, and I think that's the great thing about Russell T. Davis. Well, there are many. I'm sorry I'm an unabashed fan. Um, it, is that he's not judgmental. I'm more judgmental. Which is probably why I'm not as good a writer. He likes people you might not like. I would find her boorish, I would find her a bit thick, I would find her a bit selfish, and yet because of the way that she's present, she is all of those things, but you like her because he, because he is sympathetic to all of those things, and because we all have our bad points. And, and I wouldn't want people to write me off for, I've just listed three things that aren't nice about Donna. It's all the three things that aren't nice about me. But I, my heart is pure and I think I'm a decent person. But probably in spite of those things. It's, it's, the humanity in Russell T. Davis's writing is, is extraordinary. And also the economy. Again, that's something on your back. This has got suddenly got really dramatic because it was looking like it could be, oh, dreary life in wartime thing. You've got machine gun fire. You've got the Atmos thing, which is a nice callback to sometimes. But you've got the, you've got something on your back. Uh, and, now, and now it's getting spooky. The, 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 the sort of dramatic ebbs and flows are, are pin sharp. God, I love Doctor Who. Don't you? Don't you? I love Doctor Who. I'm really enjoying watching this. I haven't seen this for ages. Uh, I feel rotten talking through it, but that is what I'm supposed to do in this. I hope this works. This is a new thing I'm doing. Um, life in lockdown, producing Doctor Who content. Uh, yes, yeah, so, and actually, this is interesting watching this in lockdown because we are kind of all shut up behind closed doors. Society is, you know, living under compromise, but, but also with that comes blitz spirit. And, you know, the, the, the good, that's, that's why these stories are so compelling, because under such circumstances, history and drama has given us, you know, stories of great compassion and heroism and stories of great injustice and bringing out the worst in humanity because they're extreme circumstances. Uh, and, you know, Russell T. Davis knows exactly what to do with those things. Um, and of course it emphasises how great the Doctor is, <laughs> which I do think we sometimes take for granted in the show because the Doctor is our, our hero. Um, you know, what a hole in the world, what a hole in the universe the Doctor would leave. God, and if, if the Doctor had never existed, I, my life would be unrecognisable. And probably yours too. If you're watching this, I think you're probably pretty hardcore. <laughs> yeah. So, what are the things, what are you liking about this, hey? Uh, I, I, I do love all of this. Uh, this clip show stuff. And I remember when Catherine Tate was, because of course she, I don't remember when she was, because I, I knew about it when everybody else did in Runaway Bride, when, you know, it was, but then when she was announced as a companion, because I think there was a build up to the announcement, or it was, I was certainly expecting an announcement and I was doing a job, I was, I was doing a, 
corporate video about the the uh, ha uh, about housing. Doing a corporate video about housing while Doctor Who was making <laughs> some of its finest hours. I was doing a corporate video about housing. I obviously didn't turn left at the right <laughs> at the right moment in my life. Um, and the news came through. I think Johnny Candon, actually, who has who has chosen the things for this episode, I think he texted me and said, have you seen? So then I think I must have, because I don't think, I, don't, I didn't have an iPhone then, I don't think. No, I didn't have an iPhone. I don't know if they existed. Oh God, this is ages ago now, isn't it? I still think of this as quite new. I, I think of Let's Get This Party Started by Pink as quite a new song and then discovered it was 2005. <laughs> So, when was this? What, 2007? 2007, 2008? Oh my God. It's 12 years ago. 13 years ago. You're going to die. Now, this is, this is where I will. Um, what, one, I mean, come on, Rose. But she's, she's not going to die. And I, know, and, and I know they address this later when she goes, oh yeah, no, I've got to die to reset the thing, but I'm going to be fine. And Rose goes... No, I'm still going to die. Um, ah, hold that thought. And also hold the thought about the fact that this is ages ago and I think of it as quite new. Uh, I love this scene. It's one of my favourite scenes in the whole of Doctor Who. I think it's extraordinary. I think both of these actors, look at Bernard Cribbins, those eyes welling with so much watery with compassion and a, a life that's seen a lot of s sadness. I love this. Ex oh, I love, I love I'm not an emotional person. I love that. I, I find the moment of understanding between those two men when nobody else is really acknowledging what's going on and him, him going, and, and of course it's, it's talking stuff of quite big import, you know, camps, concentration camps, getting rid of foreigners, you know. It, it's, it's harkening back to one of the worst times in the world's history when real atrocities and awful things happened based on, you know, pecking orders to do with race and horse purity and all sorts of things. But actually all of that aside, that hugeness of it, it's that little moment between those two men when the and it's the fact that it's the ebullient he had to be big Rocco ebullient Italian almost stereotype guy because it makes that moment hit you all the harder I think it's brilliant I think it's one of the best scenes in the whole history of Doctor Who and actually that moment on on Joseph Long's face and then back to back to Bernard Cribbins a moment between the two men where they acknowledge you're screwed, mate. And, and you know, you know I'm screwed. And I know you know I'm screwed. But we're not going to say anything. It's heart shattering. And then to come back into this, this is a brilliant shot. Because it's actually all about Donna talk, talking, but we favour Sylvia. Uh, and Jacqueline King, who is such a presence, shattered bereft and empty. I mean, this is, you know, this is quality, quality television. I know Doctor Who's a daft old pro programme, and it is a daft old programme. It's about somebody travelling through space and time in a police box. It's as daft as a brush. But do you know what? It can be so, it can be very profound and moving too when you want it to be. And I think the fact that it's daft as a brush, it's not afraid to go to places that really move you or really have something to say, I think is good. And I don't think that's the be all and end all of Doctor Who. I think, I think, I think we could be a bit po-faced about Doctor Who. And I used to be very po-faced about Doctor Who. I used to get annoyed with people who thought it was frothy nonsense. It is frothy nonsense, but within, within popular culture that isn't high art, because it's so accessible, more accessible than high art, I think it's sort of almost more profound. Um, but, it's also frothy, silly nonsense and has a, 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 a you know, a, a not very good beetle on somebody's back. Uh, 
and I, and I think the fact that those two things can live side by side is is glorious, which is why I like Doctor Who. Um, oh, I love that scene. So, so I've got to right. I've got to, I've got to think about what I like about this story. Certainly, the Rocco uh, scene. Um, uh, I, I would say the sort of life, because I think that was the pitch. If that wasn't the pitch, that was certainly the tone of life in wartime. I like the life in wartime vibe. Um, I uh, cause all nexus. Ah, and Captain Magumbo, who is uh, Numa Dumizweni. Forgive me if my pronunciation is poor. Uh, who again? She's Hermione in Harry Potter on the stage. Uh, I do remember somebody got. I I got a bit drunk. Uh, and don't really go on forums now. Um, somebody getting very cross that you've got a black unit captain and I waded in and then got into a conversation I wish I hadn't and then I apologised because I was pissed but actually I retract that apology um, if you can't cope in a programme about somebody who travels through space and time with a police box that's bigger on the inside than it's on the outside with some casting I don't know how many black female captains there are in a fictional <laughs> army department, but it, it, it's it's not that inconceivable. It does, it, it's not casting that sticks out like a sore thumb, I think, unless you want it to. Um, and I think if you want it to, then the issue is with you and not with me. And I'm not a hugely, I hate the phrase, politically correct sort of person. I'm a bit of an old stick in the mud about some things. But, but I think if that's what you choose to take exception to, you're probably not going to like these videos uh, because I think you have to try hard to have your um, to have the fourth wall shattered for you by a piece of progressive casting. Um, I like a tin mug. Oh, it's got genuine hot stuff in it, hasn't it? Oh, I do like a tin. Tin mugs are post-apocalyptic army camp drama it's a it's a great shorthand way of going we're we're in a future where things are a bit tricky now because people are drinking out of tin mugs although tin mugs are really expensive i was really annoyed because there was a there was a homeless guy um who was having a bit of a hard time so she has made him a, a, a cup of tea and she was going to give him a, a, a china mug and i went oh no 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 give him give him a tin one just in case he drops it or whatever I don't know, it's pathetic. that's awful isn't it i was going he's 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 a homeless guy in trouble he might drop our mug give him one he can't break oh I hate me for doing that. But anyway, I said, no, give him, give him the tin mug because then if we lose it, or it gets, you know. Uh, uh, and, he, and he went and he, and he must have taken the mug with him. I was like, oh, never mind, I, I can replace it. And then looked up tin mugs online. It was a tin gardening mug somebody had given us to do the garden with. Tin mugs are really expensive. And yeah, but more expensive than a China one. Well, I, I think the one she would have given him was just a blooming... Anyway. Um... <laughs> um but tin mugs are a good way of suggesting post-apocalyptic tricky future. Um, now, hold the... I, I, it was a bit of a cheap shot when I said about the not very convincing beetle, because I rather like the beetle, the fact that it looks like a, a normal house beetle, because normal house beetles scuttle and they quite were. Um, it, is a bit re I, it is a bit retro, but... Um, retro is a very nice way of saying... <laughs> But I actually really, I like the Beetle, and I think Graham Harper shoots it quite sparingly. Um, but we can, with Doctor Who, sort of get, sometimes we can sort of go, well, it's reminiscent of the way things used to be, so it's kind of acceptable. But I think a cynical audience might go, that's not a great effect. One, one that was predisposed to, to sort of go, I'm, I'm uneasy with science fiction, I, I, I need an out, I need something to... to, to so that I could tell you how the stuff you love is rubbish, science fiction fan. Look at that effect. Anyway, um, the you're gonna die thing, I do have a slight beef with more than the Beetle, who I rather like, because we've already had Rose in uh, 
army of ghosts doomsday go this is the story of how I died and it turns out to be um, uh, uh, actually you're on a list of the dead you're not actually dead but you're you're dead oh okay but you'd only say this is the story of how I died if you were trying to be tantalising in a pre-credit sequence of a television programme that was a season finale it's a bit sort of when I say die I mean not die and then we've got this thing where she keeps saying to Donna you're going to die you're going to die uh, and yes Donna does die here but we know that that's not a real death because it averts this whole thing so this never happened but and she she covers that god she's so good and I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on a bit I don't like during this absolutely brilliant performance from Catherine Tate um, um, but 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 she sort of doesn't she? In a bit, in a bit, Donna goes, "Oh, but you know, I'm not going to actually die." I and Rose goes, oh, 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 oh. "And of course, we spend the whole of uh, Stone Earth Doomsday with one of you is going to die. Somebody's going to die. It's all going to die. Somebody's going to die." Uh, and of course, by die they mean have your mind wiped. So, not actually die. So it's it is a slightly repetitive trope of going, "Somebody's going to die." Oh no, somebody's actually going to die. Except by die we mean. Not die. And I, I think to say die and mean not die once is forgivable, but twice, I think, is, is whatever Oscar Wilde would have done to finish that slight um, misquoting. Um, but Catherine Tate is brilliant. And yes, it was Johnny Camden who's been doing this with me. That, that I, if he didn't tell me it was her, he certainly directed me to, to go and check out the news that had been announced. Uh, and I was thrilled. And I'm, I'm no, I wasn't a great fan of her show. Um, I, just, I watched it if it was on sort of thing. Um, but just the idea that a role model for lots of young girls, because Doctor Who traditionally the female companion is, you know, somebody sort of, yeah, well, you know, the demographic of normal Doctor Who companions, slightly younger than Donna, uh, more conventionally, uh, you know, what would be classed as, um, you know, for the dads. God, that, that phrase hasn't aged well. I don't, was it even well at the time? Um, but Donna is a normal-looking, ginger-haired person. Um, you know, she's she's not... You know, she's not the, the, the sort of... She's not there. Yeah. She's... She's... She's she's a more identifiable. She's less of a sort of fantasy figure than I think Doctor Who companions have, have been in the past. Uh, and I think that's really important. And let's not forget Sarah Jane, played by Elizabeth Sladen, was now, you know, an, an, an older woman who is also a role model for young kids. And it completely flies in the face of that received wisdom... Uh, that, oh, young people will only like young people. Um, I've just had something turned down on Boosie because it doesn't, it won't appeal to the 18 to 35 demographic that they want because, look at me. Um, uh, it was more, it was the content as well, but, you know, the, the inference there was uh, no way, old man. Um, which really 46 is a bit gory. But also the idea, when I was a kid, I didn't watch Dad's Army because I like Private Pike. You know, um, the idea that young people don't like people not in their age group. In fact, I hated people. I didn't want to be Luke Skywalker. I wanted to be Han Solo. Uh, you know, when I watched Battlestar Galactica, I didn't want. I didn't like that. When a kid turned up, I wanted to kick him. Um, we we aspire to be the things that we're not. Um, and anyway, yeah. So Donna, not conventional companion material, Catherine Tate, um, you know, not the traditional look of a, of a, of a companion actress, is I think a really important uh, uh, aspect that's got nothing to do with the way the stories are told, but actually what you're providing to kids and what you're saying to kids. Um, and the fact that Donna is, you know, not a not a remarkable person or or what would traditionally be seen as a remarkable person 
who nonetheless finds brilliance within her uh, is is great is great and this is really dramatic of course she lands a bit half a mile away so she's got a hair there so because this is the climax it's got to get so exciting um Catherine Tate's really good isn't she really good actress um Oh, those silver birches. God, I notice that sort of stuff now. <laughs> Where's the street that's got silver birches on? I like silver birch. We've got a sub of silver birch at the bottom of my garden. Um, oh, this is so sad. But again, it's great. Have your cake and eat it. Because you, you know, you get the marvellous self-sacrifice. But it's actually, it's what needs to be done to have the happy ending. And then happy ending means that she doesn't die anyway. Uh... Oh, she's so, oh God, it's so moving. Uh, if, even though oh, the music's great as well, it's so well done. So well done. Oh dear. Um, that was much more emotional than I'd remembered. Again, because I only really remember it for facilitating what comes next. But of course, when we were watching it, it was. It was, oh my goodness, and of course. So, and of course, this is the climax, except, and you sort of think, okay, that's done now, and that's 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 the sort of story, this is, but there's another beat to come that I think is gonna be one of my moments. I've really enjoyed this. I was expecting to quite like it, because I like this era, um, but it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, and it's an entirely a what if. It's entirely a what if, and it's a transition uh, from the rest of the season to the to the climax. But on its own, it's brilliant drama, and there's so much in there. How long is it? Forty-two minutes, maybe a bit longer, but it's packed with stuff. And here's the Doctor. We, I love David Tennant, but we haven't really missed you, I'm afraid, Doctor Who. Uh, I love their relationship. Uh, just mates and all of that. <laughs> um, this, what a time to be a Doctor Who fan this was. Uh, yeah. Considering what, considering I'd spent a lot of time very angry because Doctor Who wasn't on telly and people thought it was a joke. <laughs> just goes to show which is I think why why we keep on chucking isn't it because you know it was dead in the water and it came back and we were right and I suppose it was keeps you going in <laughs> in the face of disappointment and life's slings and arrows that actually things can be turned round I think what I was struggling to say and saying very badly and stammering over because you worry about saying oh, that what I was trying to say was that Donna is not, Catherine Tate is not conventionally attractive in the way that the sort of certain companions have been packaged. And that is not me making a value judgment on that, but I think it's, I think it's a, a fair enough comment and item. The point I was trying to make, how that this was a good thing. Um, um, in terms of what Donna represents. You, know, you can, you know, you can be a, uh, a role model without being, um, you know, young and all those other things. I love this bit. I love this bit. Da, 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 and that, that piece of music. Bad Wolf. Oh! I mean, it's a nonsense. Bad Wolf is just a piece of... It's a thing that whenever anybody says it, you'll feel dramatic. That's what Bad Wolf is. But it works. Just two words. I mean, but it doesn't, it doesn't make... It, Bad Wolf in, in uh, Parting of the Ways. It, it, it's, it's just... It's just a thing. It's a shorthand dramatic thing, but it bloody works. Uh, 
That's great. The cloister bell, all the bad wolf on all the... Uh, in all the writing. Oh, why is it the end of the universe? We've got no idea. It doesn't matter. It works. Oh, the next time trailer. Oh, yes, because it's click. Dum, dum, dum. God, oh, what a time to be alive. This was the most exciting thing ever. We are at war. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, this has just taken me back 12 years in time. Ha 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 ha. Oh, this was Satan. Oh. My God, I mean, event telly as well. I, I don't know, the credits go up way too quickly. Um, that's, a, that's a sad uh, thing of telly today. Oh, and they're going to jump because it's on iPlayer, so it's going to jump unless I press a button. Can't I just have the credits without you jumping away, please? iPlayer, you're the BBC. Um, uh, right, um, you're not a commercial channel. I'm watching it on iPlayer, it's not like... I'm going to flick over to see what's on ITV now. Just play the credits. It's a hill I'm going to die on. Uh, um, um, the memorial will have my name in a readable font, not scrolling up very quickly. So, um, uh, what? So I've got to choose my five favourite things from turn left, which are... Well, number one has got to be um, that scene between Bernard Cribbins and Joseph Long when Rocco and his family are being taken away and that moment of understanding uh, between them because that is just extraordinary. Uh, number two, uh, the, the whole life in wartime vibe, um, which is, is, is reminiscent of a lot of dramas that as a, as a kid to me seem very grown up, that the good guys living under an oppressive regime and, and having to make do and, and, and drink out of tin mugs and, and all of that it just all seemed very grown up and seemed like proper drama to me. So it's always something that, that uh, so almost a bit threadsy in there as well, you know, with, with, with sort of wire fences and military people on the streets, you know, on the ordinary streets. Seems, always seems a very, you know, it's like you, you, your, your, your freedom is being cowed, but because but for your own protection, or is it? And, you know, where, you know, if we lose our, our freedom and our society, uh, you know, at what price? All of that, all of that, life in wartime. Um, I think the whole, the whole, every, everybody from Doctor Who dies, <laughs> Torchwood, Sarah Jane, uh, Martha Jones, you know, and the economy with which that is done. The whole story, the having your cake and eating it aspect of the whole story, uh, I think is 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 brilliant. Um, Bad Wolf, but just because it took me back to when it happened, when she whispered something, and when she whispered it, I didn't know two words, what to it. And as soon as she, Bad Wolf, and then all on the writing and those shunk shunk those you know those quick cutaway shots and it is the, was the shunky music if there wasn't I felt like there was and I like a bit of shunk but a shunky music everyone likes a shunk uh, and the, you know the red of the TARDIS and the cloister bell. that moment and especially because it doesn't really mean anything but you're invested enough and they they do it well enough and they do it with such economy and economy is what it's all about with, with telling stories like this Doctor Who is really complicated to tell a story in because uh, so, you have to explain everything because it's science fiction. You have to sort of make it make sense and to do that with that sort of economy and make you sort of jump out your seat. Go, um, it's brilliant writing and it's brilliantly staged and done as well with all the, the shonks. Yeah, give me a shonk. Uh, <laughs> shonk me, baby. Um, and the, the last one, I think I'm going to have to go for, because I, I sound like I'm, um, sucking up to their master, don't I? Um, by loving it so much, but I do. This is a look. This is a look. This is a positive thing. I don't care. It's easy to be mean about Doctor Who if you're so inclined. I'm uh, we're life in lockdown. I'm trying to be positive. I'm a glass half empty kind of guy, and naturally, I'm trying to fight that. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna choose a moment that I like because it's a bit silly which is the scowly face of the Spanish maid. The way she points at her as if to go, ah, that nuclear explosion was all your fault because 
you've got a beetle on your back that I said in Spanish just to make it ultra spooky. It's just the way, it's just the look on her face, which it's like, you're a rotter. Um, <laughs> I like it. So I bet you Johnny Camden hasn't chosen that, but he might have chosen some of the other ones. Uh, my first one being um, the, the Doctor and Donna, the relationship they have. I think it is as close to perfect as possible. I love it. They're just pals running around. Um, I'd argue it's the first time he's had a proper friend friend since Sarah Jane. Um, Rose doesn't count because she wanted to, you know. Um, so yeah, them. I think, that, I think they're lovely. I love it. And, um, you know, I just hope there's no Daleks um, menacing Batman. He's behind me, isn't he? Uh, yeah, it's interesting because I, I, I mean, Catherine Tate is so good at that. Maybe I, maybe I didn't choose Catherine Tate because I, it keeps going back in my head that I rather clumsily phrased what I was trying to make a, a sort of d a decent point about the fact that she's not a sort of conventional looking companion, and it sounded like I was being insulting, and I wasn't meaning to be. And I hope that's come across, and I probably apologised for it a lot. Um, what's the problem with saying things out loud? Um, you then, then spend the whole, especially if you then put it out in the, in the public domain, even if only three people watch this, you then spend your whole time going, oh, somebody could willfully misinterpret that. And I have to, or not even willfully, I know. But anyway, but uh, no, I didn't, I, I could have chosen. Do I, but the problem is, I, I think with these, I'm going to try not to just always choose them because I love all the doctors and I love all the companions largely. You know, I love, I love the regulars, but uh, it would just be a bit boring if every time I went, Tom Baker and Elizabeth Sladen. <laughs> um, you know, Patrick Troughton and Fraser Hines uh, every, every episode. So I will try and avoid that. But I, but I think Johnny couch, couches it in enough uh, to, to make it particularly important in this. Although, although the Doctor's not really in it, Johnny. Lovely thing about Turn Left Part 2. Um, the Colasanto family, I hope I'm saying that properly, and uh, Wilf's... Um, relationship with them I think it's absolutely heartbreaking uh, and and really the, one of the lovely things about Doctor Who is that you can you, it's such fun and you know uh, mental and crazy things happening and then something like that just comes along and completely you can have very very it, not all evil things are um, pepper pot shaped or Cybermen or anything that there's man's inhumanity to man you know so that's a very I love that I, I felt it was in, I very moved lovely lovely piece of Doctor Who oh god I'm waffling here but um yeah it was fantastic um I just hope Spider-Man isn't taking care of a teddy bear somewhere he's behind me uh well yes I'm I'm having that he said the Colosanto family and Will's relationship with them which I think is encapsulated in that that fantasy I'm having that as one of my I'm having that as choosing choosing the same thing so it's one all uh, my third thing to love about the um, about Turn Left is actually the alien world we see only for maybe five minutes in the whole thing, um, but it's incredible. It's uh, the fortune teller, the, the the market, everything. It's properly realised, brilliant world. And old Doctor Who would have set six episodes there, and we spend three four minutes there. Love it. It's excellent. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Uh, it's called Shan Shen, I think, isn't it? Uh, world. Very good. Fourth is, oh, and I forgot to say, I hope um, the backseat of my car doesn't creep up on me and then go, it's behind me, isn't it? Uh, so I'm doing that now. Uh, the fourth thing to like uh, about Turn Left that I love is Donna's sacrifice. Donna turns out, begins as such a kind of um, nasty, spiky woman and um, she goes on to be just this ultimate, brilliant, brave, selfless hero. And I think after Turn Left has possibly one of the most tragic uh, departures for a companion ever. Um, but um, her sacrifice, Donna, noble indeed. Yeah, yeah, it is extremely well done. It, it is extremely well done, Donna's death, where she doesn't die. But it is very good. Uh, this is quite bloodthirsty, but uh, just the sort of offhand way we find out about all the way the rest of the Hooby gang 
have died. Uh, Sarah Jane, Torchwood, um, all of them, just Martha, the, never, you know, the, the, everybody died in the moon in the hospital. Oh, because, um, because she turned right or left. Anyway, uh, that. So they are my five. Um, I hope you didn't pick them, Toby. Uh, I look forward to seeing it. This is, uh, this is the uh, view from outside my car. So, uh, he didn't choose life in wartime. He didn't choose the scowly face. <laughs> uh, he did choose the casual way that everybody... So I chose that as well, the, the killing off of everybody uh, off screen. So I think it was... I think it's 3-2, is it? I got, I got two of Johnny's. Uh, I can't remember what my fourth one was. Life in wartime, he didn't do. Scally face, he didn't do. Rocco, he did do. The way everybody dies, he did do. Oh, I did the bad wolf thing. He didn't do the bad wolf thing. Yeah, okay. 3 2 to Johnny. Who cares? Uh, and you know what? Uh, chances are I could uh, make a different decision tomorrow, and none of it will ever have happened. But for now, uh, uh, you're all gonna die. And by die, I mean not be able to watch this anymore because it's over, which is sort of like a death. So therefore, dramatically justified. Um, I love that. I mean, I thought I'd quite like it because I like Doctor Who and I really like the Russell T. Davis era. Um, but I really like that. Sometimes you're just in the right mood, aren't you? I was in the right mood. I hope you were. I hope you've enjoyed joining me for this and will join me for the next one of these, um, which I'll, in the closing credits, to encourage you to read them and not jump over to the other side, uh, I'll let you know uh, what story is coming up next. But for now, thanks very much for joining me, uh, watching an episode that definitely took me to one of my happy times and places.